Now, in Job, where we're studying in chapter 3, let me catch us back up. In chapter 3, the prose narrative that we have in the first two chapters, that gives way to poetry. And as I mentioned, that shift from prose to poetry corresponds to a shift in focus from the test of Job's motivation for serving God to this question of human suffering. And Job, he breaks the week-long silence that he and his friends had maintained. He breaks that silence and complains bitterly about his situation and his life in chapter 3. And that then launches the three cycles of speeches that we'll see in the book. And in chapters 4 and 5, it begins with one of the three friends, Eliphaz. He says, in essence, that suffering is the result of sin. As I say, all three of the friends will present this same perspective. Slight variations on this, but that's basically the perspective. And Eliphaz says that, in essence, that, that suffering is the result of sin, whether as punishment for the sin or as discipline for it. And therefore, the way out of Job's suffering is for him to repent. And then in chapters 6 and 7, Job speaks following what Eliphaz has said, and he accuses his friends of disloyalty. And he calls them to show he has done wrong, so the kind of wrong sufficient to warrant the extreme suffering that he's undergoing. And at the end of that speech, at the end of chapter 7, he accuses God of terrorizing him and making his life miserable. And he complains that God won't give him a moment of peace or relief. And he implies that God simply has it in for him. That's Job's feeling, his perspective from this prolonged physical suffering that he's experiencing. So now we have the second friend speaks in chapter 8, Bildad. And he says in the first two verses, he opens up by suggesting that Job needs to stop that kind of talk. He needs to cease from saying those kinds of things. And he accuses Job of, of being a forceful blowhard in the first two verses here. One who speaks with passion and volume, but whose words have no real substance. And then in verses 3 and 4, he insists Job's wrong in claiming that he doesn't deserve what has befallen him because in, in Bildad's absolutist retribution theology, this sense that the wicked always suffer and the good always are rewarded. He says that, that Job, he, he needs to stop this, claiming that he doesn't deserve what's befallen him. Because in his view, in his absolutist retribution theology view, if Job is innocent, well then God is unjust or unrighteous and he knows that can't be right. He knows that can't be the case. On that same basis, he even suggests that Job's children died for their sins in verses 3 and 4 there. See, because Job knows he's innocent, as I said last week and probably the week before, because Job lives in here. Because he knows he's innocent, he at least knows that his friends are wrong in attributing all suffering to God's specific punishment or discipline for acts of sin. But he's similarly entranced by retribution theology. He shares that understanding with his friends. And because of that, and because he's in the throes of torment, and I don't want to understate that, but because he shares this retribution theology, and because he's suffering as he is, he's led to charge, he's led to charge God with injustice. Now, he's not right in doing that, as ultimately will be made clear in chapter 42. A fault, you know, he's not right in doing that. But a false accusation by somebody without affliction, somebody who's just there in calm reflection, somebody like Bildad, a false accusation by that kind of person that God governs the world by an absolutist retributive justice, that's more offensive to God 
than a false accusation by a righteous sufferer that God is unjust. And we'll see that. So this is no small potatoes what they're doing in insisting that God runs the world this way. You see, the latter, the person in Job's position, you say, well, why would that one be worse than the other? But the person who's in Job's position, the sufferer, he's honestly assessing the facts. He's honestly assessing the facts of innocence and suffering, and he's trying to make sense of those facts albeit trapped within a mistaken theological understanding. But the other person, the person like Bildad, he's closing his mind to the facts. He simply will not hear anything of Job's innocence. He's not being an honest seeker. For example, he's rejecting out of hand Job's highly credible protestations of innocence. I mean, Job is somebody who's got great credibility. And he's telling them, I'm not, but they just reject it out of hand. They will not countenance it. Won't even consider it. Just say it has to absolutely be false. Now, somebody like Job allows his theology to be challenged by facts. But in his pain, he reaches a wrong conclusion where somebody like Bildad in his hubris, he won't consider any challenge to his theology. You see, so the one who's acting in extremis, the one who's acting under the pressure of suffering, that person speaks falsely about God but maintains his integrity. In other words, he's a truth seeker. He will say, I am innocent and I am suffering because he knows that's true. And in doing that, he encourages other people to live their lives with integrity. But the one who's acting like Bildad from calm reflection, who's not in the sausage grinder of suffering, the person who's acting like that, he burdens the sufferer with a lie. That's what he's doing with Job. Job is not sinful. You know, relatively speaking, you understand. Job is not somebody who deserves this, and yet what are they telling him? Yes, you are. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. So they're piling bricks and bricks on, on Job, and that pulls Job and anybody in a similar situation toward a dishonest assessment of their lives. They're being pressured to say a lie. Yes, 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 that's right, that's right. I'm somebody who deserves this. What was I thinking? And so God looks at that and says, that's far worse and the person who accuses me of injustice when he's in the sausage grinder. And I think that's important. Now, in verses 5 to 7, Bildad assures Job that God will restore him if he will repent. And, of course, we as the readers, we know. And Job knows that his suffering is not for his sin. So that's a false prescription that is given by these wise men. They're telling Job that. He wrongly assumes that suffering necessarily is a sign of sin. And then in, eight, in chapter 8, verses 8 through 22, Bildad appeals to the tradition of prior generations. He says, look, those who forgot God, what comes of them? They wither and perish like a reed without water. They put their confidence in something that cannot support it, and their success, whatever it may be, is superficial, something that's easily removed and quickly forgotten. And then he ends in verse 20 with this succinct statement of retribution theology, where he says in verse 20, Behold, God will not reject a blameless man, nor take the hand of of evildoers. And then in verses 21 and 22, he gives further encouragement to Job to repent. I want to read to you a, <clears throat> a quote from Longman on this idea of retribution theology. Because, because if you're thinking, well, that's all kind of interesting, but that's something from bygone days, au contraire. Here's what Longman says The clearest heirs to Bildad's retribution theology are advocates of the so-called prosperity gospel, 
which proclaims that God wants to lavish health, wealth, and happiness on his faithful people. Sickness, poverty, and sadness are signs of a lack of faith. But of course, it is not just those who affirm the prosperity gospel that find affinity with retribution theology of the friends. When adversity strikes, we all have the propensity to ask, what did I do to deserve this? The assumption is that it is sin and sin alone that leads to suffering. And interestingly, my daughter uh, texted me yesterday with something she saw somebody on Facebook uh, who was part of one of these health and wealth outfits just trashing the book of Job and saying the book of Job is totally irrelevant to Christian living. And I thought, of course, they would say that. And so here you see that because they can't have that. You see, so it's like a Marcionite. We just rip out the Old Testament, the parts that don't fit with whatever we want. But uh, Longman goes on. He says, the book of Job is written as a corrective to this view, rejecting retribution theology as an explanation of Job's suffering. Although sin does lead to suffering, it does not always do so right away. See the introduction of his commentary for an explanation of the biblical view that ultimate reward and punishment happen in the eschaton in the end state. He goes on, he says, furthermore, sin is not the only explanation of suffering. Build it so you have this idea in the eschaton, things wash out. But that's not all. There are other explanations of suffering in the present life. And that's, that's the idea, you see, that the bigger picture of the book of Job, as the move shifts from his motivation for serving God to the question of suffering, the real question behind that is where does true wisdom lie? And as we watch through the book, these wise men groping who do not have the benefit of what we know as readers. And so you see human wisdom grappling with this and it can't come to the answer. Because unless God specifically reveals the reason for suffering in particular instances, it is beyond human wisdom's ability to grasp. There are things we can find out by observing reality. But this is the point, that there are things that are hidden in God and ultimate wisdom is there. Anyway, he says, furthermore, sin's not the only explanation of suffering. Bildad's perspective depends on the idea that suffering originates only in sin. This view is shared by Jesus' disciples when they came across a man born blind. Rabbi, who sinned? This man or his parents said he was born blind. The disciples could not imagine another possibility than that this man's affliction came from his or his parents' sin. Jesus broadens their horizon and ours by responding, neither this man nor his parents sinned. He was born blind so that God's work might be a real. You see, God in that case was doing something else. God in Job's case is doing something else. Now, you and I often can't figure that out. And it drives us crazy. You see, I can't understand why would that happen? Why would he allow that? Why would he do this? And we can't figure it out. And you have people who say, because of that, well, then there's no God. No. There's a God who's so tremendous and he's so mind-blowing in the, in the tapestry that he is weaving, who sees the whole thing. And you and I, as these finite, fallible people, are sitting here rooting around here going, can I see it? Can I see it? You see, so there are other reasons behind this. And God, if God doesn't reveal those to us, that's the larger point. He says, what is it about retribution theology that makes it so intractable? You can't get rid of it. He says, it's, it's comforting to those who are not suffering at the moment. After all, it gives the semblance of control. If suffering comes about only through sin, then if I do not sin, I will not suffer. To think that we might suffer without sinning is a frightening idea. But the book of Job teaches, as does the whole Bible, that we are not in control. God is. And if we read, and if, as we read on in the book of Job, we will discover the proper response to this reality. And so I thought that was, I know that was lengthy, but I thought that was worth sharing with you. All right, so we have Bildad who comes in and makes his appearance as one of Job's friends, and he speaks. And then in chapters 9 and 10, Job now speaks after Bildad speaks. And Job, you see, Job agrees. 
with retribution theology. He, theology. he agrees that God rewards the righteous and punishes the guilty, but he knows that his treatment is inconsistent with that principle because he knows that he's a righteous man. So he complains in despair. Verses 1 to 10, there's no way a mere mortal can prove his innocence before God, can establish that he's truly righteous and undeserving of his present suffering, and thus that God is violating that principle in his particular case. There's no way I can get to court and make my case. I can't prove it. He says God is so great, he's so wise, so powerful, that any contest with him would be an absolute mismatch. Even the innocent couldn't prevail when challenging their mistreatment. God would run rings around them. He would run rings around them and they'd come out worse for having tried. So God, Job is complaining, in essence, that the power differential between God and his creatures, that it protects God from accountability to his creatures. That's what Job is saying there. And then in verse 12, in verse 12, Job's perception of God at this point is that it is impossible. In verse 11, it's impossible to establish contact with him. You just can't connect with him. And then in verse 12, any attempt to gain vindication, it can't even begin. And in his pain, he complains in verse 12 that God is above accountability no one can call him on his unjustified taking from them. That he comes in and just does this, and there's no way to hold him accountable. Because Job says, the deal is, the righteous are blessed, the wicked are punished, I'm getting a hammer, and I want to call you on it. So Job doesn't recognize that there are other things going on. Because he is trapped in the same retribution theology as his friends. In verse 13, he sees God as one who's bent on expressing his anger toward him. And he notes that God is so frightening that even the allies of Rahab crouch before him. Now, this is not the person in, in uh, Joshua. This Rahab is some kind of creature or beast and though there's, there's no mention of Rahab that's yet been found outside the Bible, this creature is mentioned several times in Scripture, the name, it seems to refer to a great, a great sea creature who in pagan mythology was overcome in the process of creation. Now, it's unclear whether Rahab is a real beast, a real creature that was embellished in pagan mythology, like Leviathan, that we saw in chapter 3, verse 8, Leviathan, you see in, in chapter 41, seems clearly to be a real creature of God's. So it's not clear if that's the case with Rahab or whether Rahab's a purely mythical construction. So we don't know. We just have these references in Scripture. But th look, think of this. Even if, even if Job believed the pagan myth was true, rather than simply using a culturally accepted story to make a point. Even if Job actually believed the pagan myth was true, God does not indicate the myth was true. God doesn't say that. See, Job and his friends, they present as true many things that are wrong. God's message in the book it's normative teaching that comes in part through his correcting the misunderstandings of Job and his friends, especially his friends. You see, they're presented in the book as wisdom teachers who have a lot to learn. So you can't, when you're reading the Bible, you have to understand what is the story. You can't just parachute in, pull out something Bildad or Eliphaz says and say, the Bible says. Because you're not understanding the context in which says it. that is something that is going to be corrected. You have to have the understanding of what is the point, what is the normative teaching. So what I want you to see is that even if Job believed that, we can't know that Job believed that. 
Job may very well be simply using a culturally accepted image or something to make a point. But even if he did, that's different from God affirming that to be true. All right, so I just wanted to try to run that by you. All right, verses 14 and 15. Verses 14 and 15. Given that God is set on being angry with him, there's no hope of successfully disputing with God. Though he's in the right, he feels it would make no difference. He couldn't withstand God's questioning, and thus he couldn't establish his innocence. Even if he could summon God, And hold this great contest. It feels like it wouldn't matter because he'd get stomped. See, rather than be vindicated, shown to be right, rather than that happening, he'd be left to appeal to God's mercy to alleviate his suffering. He says, even if I was able to do this, I wouldn't be able because of this power differential to establish my case. He says in 16 to 18, That if he could summon God, and God answered, he doesn't believe God would pay any attention to his case. He doesn't think that. After all, if he was interested in Job's innocence, he wouldn't have inflicted him with such great suffering in the first place. Suffering that's so great. He says there in 16 and 18, that's so great that he can't catch his breath. And that he's filled with bitterness. And you have to, throughout this Keep in mind what this guy's going through. You keep that in mind. You keep chronic, physical suffering and pain in mind. And I'll tell you, judging for myself, if I've got pain that lasts for a while, I get crabby fast. I do not like stuff like that that hangs on and keeps nagging and nagging and nagging. And we're talking the big leagues here. So you just have to understand that, and certainly God does. He complains in, the, in verse 19 that no one can hold God accountable. And he says that even though he's in the right and blameless, God would trip him up in any confrontation, end up declaring him guilty or perverse anyway. In verse 20, verse 21, despite being blameless, Job's suffering has driven him to where he has no regard for life. Indeed, he despises it. Then in 22 to 24, he accuses God of treating the just and the wicked alike, destroying them both. He says God mocks the innocent when they undergo calamity. And he says God allows the wicked to get away with evil by covering the faces of the judges. You see, Job is indeed filled with bitterness at this point, right? I mean, I don't see any other way to look at that. As Longman points out, he says, Job is here like the psalmist in Psalm 73 before he had his sanctuary experience in which he sees the glory of God and bows before the mystery of God and recognizes that God will work everything out for good, Psalm 73, 17. Job's like somebody over here, somebody on this side. In in 25 to 31, Job addresses God directly. And he says his life is passing swiftly while he's enduring its fleeting span in suffering. Even if he was determined not to complain, if he was determined to buck up in his abject misery, he cannot escape the fear that by his suffering... He'll be condemned. All efforts to vindicate him proving futile because God has determined that he will be dirty. That's how Job feels. He can't escape this sense that not only am I suffering some indication of something, but God has set his course in his mind that I'm toast. And there's nothing I can do about it. So he carries that additional anxiety with him that God has determined that. In 32 to 35, Job again, he speaks about rather than to God. He and God are not equals, that they could go one-on-one in a court battle. And there's no arbiter available to him that will level the playing field for this tremendous disparity. He needs somebody to arbitrate. And there is nobody like that available. If God would cease punishing him, And he could be free 
from his terror. He then could actually present his case without fear, but he's not there now. He's just getting pummeled and pummeled. And then Job begins chapter 10 with another utterance of despair, a declaration that he hates life. He says he's going to complain without restraint in verse 1, without restraint in the bitterness of his soul. And his pain and his frustration are just pouring out. And you and I sit back from a very calm position and we read this and say, how can anybody say some of these things? Just remember. Just remember what he's doing, what's, what is happening to him and how long it's gone on. He you just see going, come on, this is crazy. There's no way that I should be getting punished like this. So have some sympathy for what he's going through when we see these kinds of things. He then he says in verse two that he will tell God not to condemn him, but to declare, uh, declare, declare the basis of his punishment. That's what he's going to say. If I have this thing, I'm going to say, don't condemn me, but declare why I'm being condemned. Give me the basis of my punishment. Show me my sin like he wanted Eliphaz to do. You show me what there is in my life that warrants the kind of tremendous suffering that I'm enduring. And after that, in verses 3 to 5, he addresses God with a, a series of accusatory questions, suggesting that God is unfairly punishing him, and that in doing so, God is acting like a mere human being. That's what he's saying in verses 3 to 5. He says, he says God must know that he's not guilty, and yet nobody can rescue him from the unjust punishment he's receiving in verses 6 and 7. And in 8 and 12, he calls God to remember that he made him, that he gave him life and sustained him. But then he says in verses 13 to 15 that God did so with an intent to scrutinize his life and to crush him whether he was wicked or good. You gave me life, you sustained me, but you did it just to put me in the sausage grinder. He almost sees God as, a, as sadistic. He just says, man, this is what happened to me. 16 and 17, he accuses God of hunting him like a lion and constantly assaulting him. He says in 18 and 19, he'd have been better off if he was stillborn, if he went right from the womb to the grave. And his plea in verses 20 to 22 is to be left alone by God. For God to cease inflicting him during the short time that remains of his life. Just give me a break. Just look away for a minute, will you? That's what Job is talking about. Now, unlike the psalmists and the prophets, who in their suffering, they express to God their questions, their frustrations, their doubts about his faithfulness. And his love and his commitment to them. Job, it seems, has abandoned all hope. God wants us as his children to be real with him. He wants us to be real with him. He wants us to speak honestly with him. And we know that because the Psalms are songs and prayers for the covenant community. And they contain honest and open questioning of God, as you see, for example, in Psalm 77. But God does not want us to grumble to others about him or to cross the line, which sometimes can get blurry. But he doesn't want us to cross the line from doubting him in our suffering to charging him with evil and charging him with wrongdoing. And charging, you know, it's one thing to be sitting here just going, what is going on? What is going on? Don't you love me? Don't you care for me? You're unjust. You see, there's a difference there. And so you see in the prophets and the psalmists this idea of, I want to hear your true heart. I don't want you to be plastic with me, to, to be phony with me. I want you to tell me what's going on. But there is a warning here that there is a line to be respected with God. 
God re rebukes Job in chapter 40, verse 8, for condemning him. And Job ultimately will repent in verses 42, 1 to 6, for condemning him in the course of his suffering. Now, don't get confused and say, well, does that mean his three friends are right, that he needed to repent? No, he was innocent and wasn't suffering for anything he had done. What he repents of is because of how he responded and what he said because of the suffering he endured that he thought was unjust. So there's a difference there. So don't get caught up on that. But even if Job's false charge against God, even that false charge that God is unjust, that's not a disavowal or a rejection of God. That's not a cursing of God in the sense meant by Satan at the real beginning, right, right in the first two chapters. It was a cry of cognitive dissonance. That's what it is. It's a cry of cognitive dissonance while holding on to God. An attempt to make sense out of the fact of his relative innocence and his tremendous suffering from, in a, from within a mistaken theological conviction of retribution theology, which was the accepted understanding of Job's day of God's method of operating. So he's caught. He knows these two things are true. He has a theological conviction about how God works. And he's in this dissonance that those things are producing while he's being slaughtered. So out comes this. Out comes this kind of talk. Longman says, the difference between patience and endurance is that the former is a passive waiting while the latter is active. Job does exhibit endurance, though not patience throughout the entire book. Job doesn't exhibit endurance, though not patience throughout the entire book. Even though he complains about God, he never gives up on God. He keeps going after him. Indeed, it would be wrong to hold up Job of the canonical book as an example of a proper attitude toward God, considering that God himself speaks to him out of the whirlwind and spends four chapters putting him in his place and leading him to repentance. Certainly that Job never abandoned God but kept pursuing him is a good thing, but not the best thing. Job's attitude at the end where he finally bows in submission and deference to God and in the face of the mystery of his suffering is the attitude advocated by the book of Job. You see, that's, that's the thing. Can you live in faithfulness and at peace with the mystery of the suffering? Oh, oh I want to figure it out. And if I can't understand what you're doing, I'm going to get angry. I'm going to say something's, you know, what's up? Is he there? Is he real? But that's the idea that God is calling us to because some things are hidden in the wisdom of God. Some things are hidden in that wisdom. Now, when, when he says here, it would be wrong to hold up Job of the canonical book, but he puts it that way of the canonical book because what we often do is we just go to the prologue. And we say, look at Job. You know, Job gets, he endures these things, and then Job says these things, and isn't he the model? Well, all of that is wonderful, but there's a whole book. You see, there's a whole book, and it was written for a reason. And so that's what I'm trying to help us through here. Now, Zophar, we now have, we have Eliphaz, Job, Bildad, Job, Zophar, then Job. This is the first cycle. So we have Zophar who speaks here in chapter 11. And in verses 1 to 3, he responds to Job. He, he responds that Job's foolish talk of being relatively innocent and thus undeserving of his suffering, suffering can't be allowed to stand. Do you see the same perspective that the three friends have? They're really like a team. They all have the same perspective. And this idea that Job somehow, that his, his talk about, well, I don't deserve this, that can't stand. He says in, in verses 4 to 11 that God is unimaginably great and that God understands all things, including the truth about people's iniquity. And if the truth be told, he says God's exacting from Job less than his guilt deserves. So that's this friend's uh, contribution. But he then says in verse 12, the problem is Job's foolish resistance to enlightenment. Eliphaz had told him the same thing. 
He wouldn't take his own medicine. He won't listen. He won't be, he won't be enlightened so that he then would repent and he would then be restored. If he would acknowledge his sin and repent, he says in verses 13 to 19, God would res- restore him to a blessed life. If he would do that. If he will not, verse 20, then all way of escape is lost. That's the path out. We all know that God punishes the wicked, blesses the righteous. You're being punished. Therefore, you're wicked. The way out is for you to repent and God will restore you. What don't you get about this, Job? It's not that difficult. You've said the same thing yourself. Long with comments on Zophar's contribution. He says, Zophar and his friends are totally correct. Sinners need to repent of their sins in order to restore their relationship with God. Page after page of scripture teaches this important truth. However, Zophar is wrong in this particular case. Job does not have to repent. His suffering has not been caused by his sin. He has nothing to repent of. Indeed, we readers know this without a shadow of a doubt since we're privy to God's discussions with the accuser recorded in the first two chapters. Now, Job, then, he comes in responding to Zophar with the understanding that they don't always go and particularly respond directly. But his next talk following Zophar, it's in chapters 12, 13, and 14. And in verses 1 to 3 of chapter 12, Job rebukes his friends for acting like they're the final voice of wisdom. That there's nothing left to be said once they've pronounced on a situation. When they've spoken, baby, that's it. Everybody else can pack up. Contrary to Zophar's suggestion, in chapter 11, verse 12, Job's not the least bit their intellectual inferior. So you see how this is going back and forth. These wisdom teachers who are saying, we have the insight, we have, Job, you're a bag of hot air. And so they come back and they bust on one another because your stuff is inferior to mine. And here is Job saying, look, he says, I'm not the least bit your intellectual inferior. Indeed, everybody knows God's power and knowledge far exceed that of any mortal. But that's not the issue. He says, you're giving me, you know, of course I understand that. That's not the issue at all. The issue is that Job is a just and blameless man. But God has nevertheless punished him or treated him like a great sinner. The result of which is that this is in verses 4 and 5. The result of which is that people, they laugh at him as a hypocrite. As a pious fraud. Now here's Job who's lived a righteous life. I don't know about you, but don't you hate it? When somebody falsely views you some way. If you're doing right and living right and to have people mock you and laugh at you as though you're really a sinner, you see, you don't understand how I'm using the term sinner. Well, you would feel, man, you know, I'm, I'm despised in the eyes of the society. That's the first bell, right? Yeah. All right. I'm despised there and yet, uh, you know, and yet I've been living a, a righteous life. You see, so Job... I mean, he, Job is ex- experiencing this. He's being treated that way. And those who are not being afflicted, they look down on those who are being afflicted, believing it's only for those who slip into sin. See, infliction and suffering and hardship and those things, sadness, poverty, you plug it in. That those things are only for those who somehow are away from God because if you weren't, if you were close to God, it would all be Cadillacs and uh, all this kind of stuff. You see, that's just a lie. <clears throat> now, God is willing to punish the innocent. That's implied in verse, in verse 6. That God is willing to punish the innocent is implied by the fact, says Job, that he's willing to bless the sinful, to give peace to robbers and security to idolaters. See, that's the other side of the injustice coin. If you live under this retributive theology, retribution theology, and you say he always punishes the wicked and rewards the righteous, and you say, so here you're getting the hammer, you have to be so. He says, well, wait. Don't you see that there are the wicked are blessed? 
You see, so that's just the flip side. The implication is, is that God is willing to punish the innocent. Job asserts as fact that this occurs. As fact that this occurs, that God gives peace to robbers and security to idolaters. And he says even the beasts, the birds, the bushes, and the fish. You can see this in this debate with these wise people, right? He said, even the fish know this. The fish know that this occurs by God's hand. That's 7 to 9. Then in verse 10, after all, the life of everything is in God's hand. In verse 11 and 12, that's a declaration that should be accepted by any discerning hearer and one that squares with the wisdom of the aged. So he makes that point. Then in 13 to 25, the blessing of the sinful and by implication, the punishment of the righteous, the other side of that coin. The blessing of the sinful, and by implication, the punishment of the righteous, obviously is by God's hand, because his power is such that no intention of his can be subverted, can be subverted, stalled, or thwarted. That's what he says there. If he didn't want robbers to be at peace, and idolaters to be secure, they would not be. So he's making the case, do you see, something that even the bushes and the fish know, that this protection of these people is by God's hand. You see, the blessing of the sinful, I'm sorry, Job repeats this in, in 13, 1 and 2. He repeats that his friends are in no way his superiors in the matter of wisdom. And then in 3 and 4, he wants an audience with God. He wants to come before God to present his case, but his friends, what do they do? They whitewash the situation. His friends, they lie about Job's sinfulness. Job is not sinful, but they lie about his sinfulness to cover up the inconvenient truth within their theology that God is punishing a righteous man. They simply can't hear that. So what do they do? They lie about Job's situation. They're so wrong that the wise thing for them to do, he says in verse 5, is just to shut up. You know, you are so far off that you ought to just keep your mouth shut. He says in verses 6 to 12, there he asks if they'll lie for God. If they will act as unscrupulous advocates for God. Are you people who are over here serving God and now you're going to be liars for God? Is that how you think this works? Will you act as unscrupulous advocates who twist the truth, trying to protect God, trying to do, you know, go in his favor? I heard that, Bill. Uh, he, he then warns, it, warns them that God knows the truth and he'll not be pleased with their partiality. You see, their unfair assessment of this situation, he says, God will rebuke them for what they're doing, that his dread will fall on them. And that is what happens in 42.7. That is what God gets on them about, you see. He says in verse 12 that their words have no substance. All right, I wanted to get to the end of that so I can remember where we are. Uh, but thank you for coming.